first of all, I have to say I was a little reluctant to give this talk because I think there's a lot of people here that could could talk about the population science aspects of this a lot better than, than I. Uh, but I think the reason people wanted me to talk about this is, is to sort of bring in some of the um, virologic aspects of the potential benefits. So this is just going to be a, a really brief overview of things that I think a lot of these topics we'll talk a lot more about as we go on through the next two days. So next slide. Get yeah, my second slide up. I, I'm not seeing the slide, so. Neither are we. <laughs> <laughs> I see them, John. And <laughs> they're coming. Yeah. Okay, they're coming. You can see them because I've got them on my screen here, but not not from you. So, so I'm just going to first of all go through what I feel are the potential benefits of vaccinating sexually active women. There we go. Um, and then maybe the next slide, I'm going to talk about some of the issues with each of these. So the, the most obvious thing that I probably don't even need to say is you can get primary protection from types that haven't yet been encountered. Um, and of course, if you don't have women infected, then you're going to get secondary infection by preventing transmission from partners, which overall will lead to increased immunity in the population. Now, the two more virologic things that maybe some of you haven't thought about quite as much is that there's a possibility of, of vaccinating a woman who's already infected that this will reduce the risk of progression by preventing an infection that may be in the lower genital tract from progressing via auto inoculation that would then lead to, to infection of the transformation zone, whereas we all know that's where most of the cancers arise, or the endocervical um, canal uh, that uh, wouldn't necessarily be as easily infected. And lastly, the idea that Tino brought up, I think this morning, is that if a woman is, 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 is infected, she's gonna be shedding virus. And now that virus, if you now vaccinate her, is gonna come in contact with antibodies in the cervical vaginal secretions due to transubation. And so in theory, it could prevent transmission to a partner if they're not already infected. So let's look at the next slide, which is actually the last slide. This is the shortest talk I think I'll have, I will have ever given. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of primary protection, I think we all kind of realize that, that this is the law of diminishing return, that as women get older, the chances of pre-existing immunity to the vaccine types increase. Now, one of the issues I think is, is whether immunity wanes over time in that you know, can you boost immunity by vaccination? Of course, this gets to the question of whether immunity is basically um, cell-mediated immunity after clearance or whether antibodies still play a role. And of course, the diminishing returns is, is, is generally due to sexual activity, risk of acquisition decreases. But an important point I think that, that we need to address or think about is whether the risk of progression to cancer is the same if you get infection at a 15 year old or get it at a get get your initial infection at 45. I mean, what is the absolute risk of cancer if you don't get your initial infection until 45? Um, and so it, it may be quite low. And so the benefit of preventing cancer by vaccinating a 45 and preventing a primary infection at 45 may be low. But in my mind, I'm not sure how how, how much we really know about that. Um, there is, I think, some, some older data that um, age at, at, at initiating sex is an independent risk factor for cervical cancer, independent of, of the number, taking into account the number of lifetime sexual partners. So it may be that the more mature cervix is, is less, has less potential for um, oncogenic progression. In terms of secondary prevention, prevention of males, obviously, this, this is going to vary depending upon the sexual um, assortment patterns. And of course, MSMs, I forgot, the, <laughs> I left off the first M. Um, it's, not, it's not going to protect that. That's pretty obviously. In terms of herd, herd immunity, um, the question will be how large of an effect or what's the added value of, of vaccinating older, older women. And it would really be interesting to, in a population, do a single sweep where we would vaccinate, say, all women up to the age of 50 and really see whether we reduce 
um, the prevalence so low that we're actually will build up enough so much immunity that it would be actually resistant. The population would be pretty highly resistant to you know sort of random introductions from the outside. Um, this is a thought experiment, but it actually at some point you know to think about running a trial we would really look at at how long we would we would maintain low levels of of infection rates by doing a single sweep of trying to vaccinate everybody presumably with one dose now this idea that that you could reduce the the risk of progression by vaccinating someone with with that already has an infection i have found really really appealing for a long time um, the only problem with this is we haven't seen it in the clinical trials. So all most of the trials have looked fairly closely to see whether vaccinated women have, have a lower risk of progression to um, SYN2-3. And to my understanding, it's never been detected. So I'm not quite sure, you know, either this, either this isn't happening or um, it's, it's subtle. Like for instance, it may be that that this this ascending infection occurs, but it happens so rapidly that we can't really see it in a clinical trial. Um, but it's a question of of how big of an effect this would really have on a population basis, based on the fact that we we haven't been able to see it in a clinical trial. And then the last idea, again, which I, I find very appealing, that that again you could you could reduce you could increase herd immunity by reducing transmission from an infected woman. Um, and a question that I think, you know, then we'll talk about later is, is, is there a way to experimentally verify that this can happen? And you can think of two ways. One, one could be at the level of, uh, of a tissue culture experiment. And um, the other way would obviously be, be more of a clinical trial where you can actually show that an affected woman after vaccination is less likely um, to transmit. So that's really pretty much what I have. I mean, I, what I'd like to do is, is, is open it to the floor. And if other people have other ideas in terms of, of potential benefits or initial comments on this, like I say, I think many of these things we'll cover again later in the, in the talk or later in, in, in the, this meeting.